really exciting to be here. And by here, I mean the stage, because it's warm. <laughs> Bad luck to all of you. Um, OK. Does anyone remember sea monkeys? Yes. Oh, oh, OK, L loads of you. Um, yeah, these little things, you got eggs, you put them in a water bowl, and they would hatch into these little shrimp-like things. Yeah, so you, you remember them. I am now going to ruin sea monkeys for you. Uh, sea monkeys are a, a brand name. They're actually a thing called brine shrimps, uh, or artemia, and they look like this. Um, they swim around as individuals usually, but they can also form these really large shoals. Um, a single brine shrimp is about a centimeter long, but these shoals can extend for meters. So the question I want to ask you now is, why do, why do they do this? What's the advantage for them uh, for ga in, ga in gathering in large groups? Well, lots of animals form large groups. We've got zebra herds and um, starling flocks and fish shoals. And the usual explanation is that they're getting safety in numbers, right? So as a group, um, any single individual is less likely to get eaten if a predator attacks. But that's not what's happening here. In fact, the exact opposite is happening here. Because Artemia gets attacked by a tapeworm, a parasite that lives inside them and drains the nutrients from their guts. Uh, this isn't the exact tapeworm that uh, affects the shrimp, but since you're going to have to look at this thing for the next minute or so, I went for the least revolting picture of a tapeworm <laughs> that I could find, which was really hard. <laughs> so when the tapeworm gets inside one of the little sea monkeys, um, it does five things. Uh, it castrates them, thanks. Uh, it makes them live longer. Um, the castration is the least interesting bit here, so we'll get that out of the way. Uh, it makes them live longer. It changes their color, so they go from transparent to bright red. It makes them swim quite close to the surface of the water, and it makes them gather in large groups. So the grouping shrimp are much more likely to carry a tapeworm inside them than the ones that are swimming solo. Why does it do that? Because like many parasites, the tapeworm has a very complicated life cycle that involves hopping between lots of different hosts. And the shrimps are just an intermediary. The final host, the only one in which this thing can reproduce and create the next generation of tapeworms, is the flamingo. This wasn't planned, but this stage is about to get a lot more sinister in about five minutes. <laughs> There are also eggs in this talk, bad eggs. Uh, OK, so to, um, the flamingo is the final host. So if the tapeworm gets into the shrimp, it needs somehow to get into the flamingo. And it does that by changing the body and the behavior of the host it's currently in, the shrimp, by making them more conspicuous, by making them swim closer to the surface of the water, and by making them gather in these large, really obvious to see groups the tapeworm ensures that its, the, its shrimp is more likely to get eaten by a flamingo. So it's in keeping with the theme of uh, tonight's talk, tonight's event, um, the, tape, the, the shrimp's reality has been completely overwritten by this parasite that lives inside it. That is the secret of the Artemia swarm. It's not safety in numbers, it's danger in numbers. Um, and this sort of thing happens all the time in, in nature. It's incredibly uh, sinister and unsettling stuff, this idea that um, these hidden, unseen forces could be living inside creatures and controlling their, their minds and their behavior. Um, when we think about animal behavior, we, we make this really big assumption which is that the animals themselves are in charge of their, are in charge of their actions, that they're in control. And as this example tells us, that's often not the case. Um, and you know, if, if some of you are a bit freaked out by this concept, then that's perfectly natural. A lot of our best fiction, a lot of our sci-fi, um, revolves around uh, horrendous tales of mind control and puppet mastery. We rail at the idea that some nanny state might be telling us what to do. We find it very disconcerting, uh, the, uh, the prospect that organizations might be controlling our efforts. But this sort of thing happens all the time in nature. For, for our team here, when it gets infected by a tapeworm, um, it's effectively, the, the shrimp is effectively not a shrimp anymore. Um, all it is is a vehicle for getting the tapeworm 
into the flamingo. Now, I've been writing about um, mind-controlling parasites for many years now after I read a book called Parasite Rex by a really good uh, science writer called Carl Zimmer. You should all read it if you haven't already. Um, and once you start learning about these things, you see them all over the place. Um, and there are so many great stories. This, this tapeworm example only came out about a month ago. So let me just run through a couple of my other favorites. Uh, this caterpillar is kind of thrashing about manically, and the little insect that was running up the branch is now crawling away, looking a little bit bemused. And you can't see it anymore, that's annoying. Uh, okay, let's watch it again. If you look at what's on the branch next to it, it's got, they're these little white cocoons. So is the caterpillar guarding its own cocoons? Well, not really. Uh, this thing is a zombie caterpillar, and those are the cocoons of the thing that killed it. Because a while back, the caterpillar got attacked by a parasitic wasp that laid eggs inside it, uh, about 80 eggs. The eggs hatched into little larval wasps that started eating the caterpillar alive before eventually bursting out and spinning the cocoon. So it's a bit like Alien, right? You know, John Hurt with a chest burster, but like 80 of them. <laughs> now, somehow, the caterpillar doesn't die. What, it, what happens is that it becomes a bodyguard for the wasp cocoons. It just stays there. It doesn't eat. It doesn't move. It just violently headbangs whenever something comes near. <laughs> Um, and its reality, too, has been completely overwritten. It looks like what happens is that there are wasp grubs, there are a couple of the wasp grubs that stay behind in the caterpillar and somehow control what is basically its corpse now um, to make it defend its siblings. Here is another example. Um, I was hoping to be able to pause this video before... Okay, this is a suicidal cricket. It's about to jump into this pond and it will drown. Now, uh, I was hoping to pause it, but you're not going to get a choice. This is what killed the cricket. This is a Gordian worm or a horsehair worm. It's been growing inside the cricket, really growing really quite big. Yeah, really quite big. Sorry. Um, yeah, the worm's, been, the worm's been growing inside the cricket, but it needs to <laughs> just play it on loop for the rest of the night. Bye. Um, the worm grows inside, goes big inside the cricket, as you saw, um, but to reproduce, it needs to get into water. And it does that by releasing proteins, which basically derange the cricket's brain so that it starts behaving really erratically. And whenever it gets near water, in this case a swimming pool, maybe a pond or a lake, it'll just jump in. And the worm can wriggle out and create more worms. Uh, one more example. Uh, some of you may prefer this one because everyone hates cockroaches. And this one is about to have a really bad day because that is Ampilex compressor, the emerald cockroach wasp, what I think is a very beautiful insect that just happens to, lay, uh, to feed its young on live cockroaches. Um, when it meets a cockroach, it stings it in the brain. Um, the wasp venom doesn't kill the cockroach, it merely stupefies it enough that the wasp can grab it by its antennae and walk it back to its burrow like a dog on a leash. Once there, uh, the roach gets buried, the wasp lays an egg, and yes, you've guessed it, larvae burrows into the roach, eats it, eventually comes out as a wasp. Um, and actually, just last month, the scientists who've been working on this discovered that the so dirty is the cockroach that the little wasp larva kind of slathers about this antibacterial spit to just clean its larder stroke nursery. Um, and they discovered this by installing a little transparent window in the side of one of these parasitized roaches, which is one of those experiments that, I just, that just makes me think, what were your dinner conversations like that night? Like, hey, how was your day at work? I went to loads of meetings. Well, I installed a little plastic window in a roach. <laughs> okay, so all these examples have, have this theme of uh, parasites controlling the host. So 
cricket becomes suicidal, the worm becomes a zombie bodyguard, the roach becomes basically a dog on a leash. Um, and when you start learning about these things, you start wondering if all kind of weird examples of animal behavior are actually the work of really gross mind-controlling parasites. Um, and you'd probably be right. Uh, these, these, as I said, these things are everywhere. And just in case any of you were thinking of sleeping tonight, um, they're not niche parts of uh, the world around us that we can kind of ignore. Um, actually, they are everywhere. Um, a group of scientists looked at this Californian estuary, so a river system, and basically dissected and weighed everything that they could find and found that the total mass of all the parasites was the same as all the fish around. So these are tiny little worm-like things, but there are so many of them that they equal the fish in weight and were about three times as heavy as all the birds. So there's loads of them. They're incredibly important. Um, I've shown you a lot of insects tonight. Um, by far, the vast majority of animal species are insects, and around 10% of insects are parasites of other insects. Um, you can also get these crazy, um, like, Russian doll-type parasites. So this is a wasp called Lysibia nana. Uh, this parasite specializes in laying its eggs on other wasps that lay their eggs on other insects. Um, the technical term is a hyperparasite, but basically it's like parasite inception. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, and these things, are, uh, these things are really revolting, right? Firstly, being eaten alive is not fun in games, uh, and having your mind control is a bit sinister. But I think there are two other reasons, specifically, why these things are so disconcerting. Um, one, they are, they are incredibly specific in what they do. So let's go back to the wasp. As I said, the wasp doesn't kill the cockroach. Its venom doesn't paralyze it. It is a highly specific chemical weapon. All it does is destroy the cockroach's motivation to walk. Otherwise, it's a completely normal roach. If you flip it on its back, it will flip the right way up. If you put it in water, it will swim away. The only thing it won't do is walk away from the thing that's going to lay eggs on its body. Um, Here's another example. Uh, this is a thing called Toxoplasma gondii. It's a parasite that infects uh, all sorts of mammals, so humans, uh, cats, rats. Cats are the important host. They're the one it needs to get into in order to reproduce. But it often gets into rats. So if it gets into rats, it needs to somehow get into cats. If a, if a rat without toxo smells cat urine, it runs in the sensible direction, which is away. If a toxo-infected cat smells cat urine, it runs two words, straight into the jaws of death. Um, and toxo is so subtle that if you took an infected rat, um, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. It might be a little bit more active, it'll be a little bit less fearful of open spaces, but it'll have this bizarre attraction towards cat urine. And the parasite is so specific that it's, the rat will still be afraid of dog piss. It will still run away if it smells that. It's only the smell of cat piss that makes it behave strangely. Um, and how, how is that even possible? Uh, the answer is really we don't know. Um, we know that Toxo releases a chemical that makes more dopamine in the brain. Dopamine is a, is a brain chemical involved in reward and motivation. We know that the parasite specifically affects parts of the brain involved in things like sexual arousal. So it's possible that in this rat, this innate fear of cats has been replaced with something a little bit like lust. Uh, but, but otherwise, it's really bizarre. None of that explains why it's um, sensitive to dog urine, but not cat urine. Um, and that, that brings me to the, the other really disconcerting thing about mind-controlling parasites, which is that they are often incredibly simple creatures that are infecting the behavior of things that are much more complex than they are. So remember the tapeworm at the start. A tapeworm is basically a long intestine with a mouth at one end and some genitals. And it's controlling a shrimp. Um, which is much more, uh, which is sort of much more complicated than it is. Toxo is even more ridiculous. Toxo is a single cell, and it's infecting the brain of a rat, a mammal brain. That's not that far off to it controlling the brain of a human. 
Like, sure, we are more intelligent than a rat, we have bigger brains, but it's basically the same structures, the same types of cells, the same chemicals. And yeah, the same parasites. There is some evidence that toxo affects human behavior as well. For a start, it's really common. Um, so estimates vary from study to study, country to country. The French seem to have a lot of it for some reason. Um, but it seems that like all, if you take the global population, about one in three people are toxo carriers. Just look around the room right now. I'm seeing hundreds of smiley toxo infested faces. Um, now, for the most part, nothing happens. Like the rat, you can't tell. Um, the, some, in very rare cases, where people have weakened immune systems, you get a disease called toxoplasmosis, which is bad news. But again, for the most part, the parasite just holds up in the brain in these dormant cysts and does nothing. Or does it? Um, we know from that, um, there have been a few studies suggesting that people who carry toxo uh, answer personality questionnaires differently. They seem to be more likely to get into car accidents. And there's some really tantalizing evidence that people with schizophrenia are more likely to have this thing in their heads than people who don't. Now, firstly, don't panic, because as I said, this is quite common. Schizophrenia is very rare. So even if it's doing something, it's not doing it all the time. But, and also, the, this, these studies are quite inconclusive. But just think about everything that I've told you tonight about how sophisticated the manipulations of parasites can be and how common they are, how common toxo is. It really wouldn't surprise me if these things were also influencing our behavior um, in, and maybe even shaping the course of human culture because they're so common. I think this is the thing about parasites. Um, they can seem really, really terrifying, and especially for us because we play so much uh, um, importance on our independence and our sense of free will, um, that this concept that things could be manipulating us uh, is, is really disconcerting. And yet, it's not a niche part of nature, it's a very core part of the world around us. And I think the more we find out about them, the more interesting they become. And regardless of whether Toxo is affecting our, um, <laughs> our behavior or not, I think the one thing that parasites definitely do is fascinate and intrigue us. And I hope that after this talk, you agree.